Hi guys, today we're going to talk a little bit about color. So this is a favorite subject of mine, I love color, and um, how we're going to talk about sort of what it is, how it influences fashion design, and how fashion designers use it, uh, how we can create color palettes appropriate for our collection, and all that fun stuff. So color, what is color? So um, we all know what color is, obviously on sort of a surface level. Um, you, we learn it when we're little kids, the differences between the colors, even how we can mix them and different things like that. But what exactly is color? So color is light. Color is hidden within light. We can see that when it refracts into a rainbow. So when a rainbow occurs, the sunlight comes down and it gets broken up by little sort of moisture droplets in the air um, and the colors that are hidden within white light refract out to these beautiful arcing patterns. And that's why we typically see rainbows around uh, rainstorms and things like that when there's enough moisture in the air uh, to create a rainbow. And uh, rainbows contain all of the colors that we can humans can perceive. Um, and this range of light is called visible light, and it's part of a larger electromagnetic spectrum. Now actually, you know, these are all the colors that we can see as humans, but different animals on the planet can see different ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum. So some animals can see fewer colors than we can, so a lot of, um, you know, other types of mammals um, and things like that, you know, everyone sort of knows dogs can't see colors quite as well, they can't see as many colors as we can. They're not colorblind, they just can't see as many colors as we can. Um, so we have that sort of advantage over them, I guess. Um, but when we move to other species like insects, like especially butterflies and um, pollinators um, and some types of bird species, they can actually see more colors than we can. So their rainbow has a few extra bands of colors on there um, because they can see a larger part of that uh, electromagnetic spectrum. So that would be neat to see as a butterfly for a day and see all those colors and infrared lights that we can't see uh, with our normal human eyes. Anyway, when we perceive something as being a certain color, it is because light interacts with the surface of this object. If an object is red, it's because red light bounces off the surface and other colors get absorbed. Um, so basically, when, like I said, if we see something is red, it's because it has pigments in it, and pigments create colors, and we know that from art. Um, but everything has a certain pigment to it, and these pigments will interact with the light, and it will absorb um, a lot of light, but also reflect and bounce back uh, certain wavelengths of light. And those light that the light that gets bounced back is the color that we see. So it's very interesting. Um, and this is why light affects uh, color so much. So um, before when I was talking a little bit about, you know, lighting your um, photograph or your sketches to be photographed, uh, I talked about how sunlight was really, really beneficial. And you can sort of see um, colors being a little bit brighter on a bright sunny day. Um, and this is why, you know, different things like red lights or blue lights will, you know, affect the color of, di of different things. Also, um, the different types of light. So other than sunlight, if we have sort of an incandescent bulb or a fluorescent bulb or an LED bulb, all those different types of light will affect sort of how colors uh, seem to our eye. So you can look at things under different light and the color will appear slightly different depending on what kind of light you use. So again, since color is light, light plays a big, huge role in how we see color. The color wheel. So the color wheel is a visual representation and organization of the visible light that we can see. Um, and it allows us to understand the different relationships between the colors and form different strategies of harmonizing the palette. So this is a very basic color wheel over here. And you can see sort of, it's like a, a, a rainbow, but put into a circle. Um, we have all those sort of lovely colors we get in the rainbow but we have organized them to sort of blend into one another. And we can see the red, uh, if we start here, blending into purples, blending into blue, blending into green, blending into yellow, blending into orange, and then back to red. 
Um, and this is sort of an artificial construction, but it really helps us understand um, the different relationships between colors and be able to form different sort of theories and methods on how to uh, harmonize our colors together. So let's look at a few of them. But first, let's take a little bit of a look at our different colors and what we call them. So first we have our primary colors, and primary colors consist of red, blue, and yellow. Okay, so um, here's our primaries, and here's where they sit on the wheel. Um, primary colors are colors that exist on their own, uh, meaning that no other colors are necessary for their creation. So we don't mix any other colors to get red, blue, and yellow. They are just pure hues on their own, and all other co uh, colors um, exist between sort of harmonizing and mixing um, these primary colors. Next are our secondary colors. And the secondary colors are equal mixes of each combination of our two primary colors. So they are orange, green, and purple. Of course, red and yellow giving us orange, blue and yellow giving us green, and red and blue giving us purple. Excuse that little typo I have down there. Um, so those are our secondary colors. And secondaries, again, they're 50-50 mixes. Can we make a million different purples by mixing different amounts of blue and red? Yeah, of course. But the secondary color is sort of the halfway point in between those two primaries with a 50-50 mix of both of your primaries. Then we have our tertiary colors. And the tertiary colors are unequal mixes of primary colors. And they represent a sort of midway point between our secondary and um, primary colors. So as we can see here on the wheel, we have the secondary color of purple and the primary color of red. And in between the two, we have this sort of magenta, which represents a more red heavy purple. Um, and then, you know, moving along between purple and blue, um, we have this sort of royal purple, kind of a very bluish uh, purple again representing the sort of midway point between our secondary purple and our primary blue so on and so forth around the color wheel and we have six tertiary colors um, again magenta sort of your royal purple um, a sort of light sort of cyan sky blue um, a spring green a goldenrod and then a dark red orange or like a russet color then of course we have um, a large multitude of other hues so our primary, secondary, tertiary are all sort of specific mixes of our hues, but we can mix them at all different varying levels to get a huge amount of colors and different hue tones. So you can add just a little bit of red with your blue and get, you know, a, a kind of cooler kind of red um, leaning towards purple. Um, and again, just by changing the mounts that we uh, blend them into one another, we can get all these wonderful hues. Now we also have what's called a tonal range. Um, so the tonal range refers to the spectrum from black to white and the different shades of gray that, uh, grays that are produced by doing so. Science and art actually have a differing definitions for what white and black are. So in science, because colors come from light, White is the presence of all colors, and black is the absence. That's why we can't see colors in the dark, nor can we see much of anything in the dark. Um, but in art, since colors come from pigments, uh, black is the presence of all colors, and white is the absence. So either way you look at it, you're both you're correct and incorrect at the same time. Um, just pick which definition I guess you like best. Um, and here we have again our tonal range from mixing uh, black and whites together with all of our lovely grays in between. So by using our tonal range and mixing it with our pure hues, we can get a whole nother different level of uh, colors. Um, we can create many, many more colors by mixing pure hues, any, which is any combination of primary colors um, with black, white, or gray. We can mix different ratios of each to create different colors. Uh, when a color palette uses only one hue with different shades, tints, and tones of that hue, we call it monochromatic. And I'll talk about that a little bit later because that's one of our harmonizing uh, strategies. 
So here's a little bit of an explanation of how we can create uh, different colors just by adding black, white, or gray. So when we add pure black to a hue, um, let's take this pure hue of red and add different varying amounts of black to it. And that uh, is what we call shades of black. Um, so we add a little bit of black and we get a little bit darker color, add a little bit more, a little bit darker, so on and so forth till we get all the way to black. Um, when we add white to a color, oops, sorry about that. When we add white to a color, we call it a tint. So of course, um, same as with our black, we start with the pure hue, and then we add a little bit of white, make it a little bit lighter, and uh, we call these tints. We can also call them pastels. Um, pastels are typically hues that are mixed with uh, white to give them a sort of lighter, sort of softer um, uh, feeling. And then of course down here we have tones. And like the other ones, what we do is we start with the pure hue and then we add different amounts of gray until of course we get all the way to gray. Now you can use different types of gray. So you can get different effects. If I used a lighter gray, I'd get a slightly different effect than if I used a darker gray, so on and so forth. So we have a large variety of uh, tones that we can create with any one hue just by adjusting uh, the ratio of hue to gray and adjusting the type of gray that we use, again, whether it's darker or whether it's lighter. Um, and we can use this strategy a lot to sort of tweak and touch into our colors. So what about brown? We did Brown was not on our color wheel, so what is it? So typically brown is uh, created by adding black to orange. And here we can see that shade range of orange. Here's the pure who, and we're adding different amounts of black to it. And as we do, it gets a little bit more brown as we go. Um, typically again, we're mixing black to orange to create brown. But of course, like any other colors, we can tweak uh, what goes into that mixture, whether it's it's another gray or it is a, um, a, a slightly different orange, make it a little bit redder, make it a little bit more yellowy, um, to get these sort of different uh, styles of uh, gray and of course, or I'm sorry, brown. And again, maybe uh, if we wanted a little bit of a cooler brown, we can add uh, a kind of cool gray, a dark cool gray to get our, our uh, cool brown, so on and so forth. So there are other color wheels out there, um, and you'll certainly find them if you try to Google color wheels. Um, but our two main alternate ones, um, so the one I showed you is, is really great for artists and understanding the color wheel. Um, these color wheels, uh, the CMYK and RGB color wheel, um, are alternative ways of understanding the visible light spectrum. They each have been developed to help achieve the ability to render the visible light spectrum in different forms. Uh, RGB is the most common color mode in which screens produce color. So your cell phone, your TV, your computer monitor, they're all using an RGB color scheme. So that means all the little tiny white pixels are either flashing red, green, or blue, and the combination of which creates all the different colors. Now it's rather complex how it does it, so I'm not really going to get into it now because it's not that important for us, but it's good to know about. Especially again when you are um, selecting a color mode in Illustrator or uh, Photoshop. You want to select an RGB color mode if your work is going to be shown on screens. Um, it will be best calibrated for that medium. CMYK um, is the color mode which most printers achieve color. So again, if you're going to be printing out your work, you want to use the CMYK color wheel. And as you know, if you have a printer, um, that's how printers work. We buy um, CMYK ink, um, and through just those four colors of ink, it produces all the other different colors. And of course, RGB standing for red, blue, green, uh, CMYK standing for cyan, magenta, yellow, and uh, the K is black. Um, I forget why the K is black, but you can Google it, <laughs> but it is um, a little, a little counterintuitive, but there you are. So how to design with colors. So how do we pick the right color palette for a collection? So now that we understand a little bit more about what color is 
and how the color wheel works and how we create our different colors, let's look at the different relationships between the colors. Um, and also, <laughs> sorry, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, I forgot. Um, colors have meaning. So uh, let's take a little bit of a closer look before we get into the relationships between the color and take a little bit of a look at each one of these different colors and think about the emotions that colors have. Um, now, we're going to go over some sort of general basic ones, but every culture, depending on where you are, will have different associations with colors. And it will vary from place to place and culture to culture, um, but since a lot of our connotations with color come from nature, you'll find a lot of crossover and there's some sort of like universal uh, human relationships that we can kind of look at with color that we'll see sort of across the board. And again, it's important to understand sort of the emotions that colors have when creating our collection. Um, we want to sort of tie our collection and our looks with emotions that are conducive with our customer. Um, and companies do this all the time. They want to create color palettes and color combinations that have an emotional reaction with our customer. Uh, just for example, so uh, we all know that McDonald's colors are red and orange, right? So why are they like this? Well, red and orange are very exciting colors. Um, they have a lot of energy tied to them, and typically when we get very excited and energetic, it makes us hungry. Um, that, and you can see them very well. So if you're driving by and you see red and uh, or yellow together, it's very visible. So you can just pull right in. Um, so again, they chose those colors for with a, a solid purpose. We want to make our customer excited. We want our customer to be able to see our signs, especially since, you know, McDonald's has a lot of drive throughs If they're just driving, you want to make it highly visible. Um, and also, we want to make our customers hungry. Uh, so especially red can make us very hungry. Um, as we'll look at that, that's our first co uh, color. It has a lot of connotations to sort of lust and want and need and passion, um, uh, which can go along with making us hungry. And designers do the same thing. They'll choose uh, colors that have different sort of emotional ties uh, to what they want to represent in their collections. So let's start with red. So red is a very powerful color and can elicit powerful emotions. Uh, red can represent anger, love, lust, violence, rightness, or danger, right? So um, just think of that sort of, you know, iconic image of the woman in the red dress and sort of all the things that are tied with that. It's tied with sexiness, maybe tied with aggressiveness, uh, tied with lust, um, energy, uh, passion, romance. Um, all these things are tied to the color red. Next we have orange. Orange can easily grab our attention and usually draw the eye quickly. Uh, bright oranges are so easily visible that they are found on many objects that need to be easily and readily seen. So that's like our parking cone. So again, it also makes, us, uh, it, makes it a little bit of a difficult color to use in a pure hue um, it, because of the attractiveness to the eye. Um, it really depends on your customer. Uh, if your customer is more outgoing, more sort of self-confident, they don't mind all the eyes in the room on them or potentially want all the eyes in the room on them, orange will be a great color. Now it's very interesting because uh, brown is really a derivative of orange, um, but brown is such a more easy color to wear. Um, it, it's not so stand out. You see it everywhere. It kind of blends in, um, so on and so forth. But anyways. Um, so what can orange represent? Well, it can represent harvest, fire, warmth, excitement, caution, um, and again, a really nice sort of fall color as well. Um, like I said, a lot of our color choices depend on the environment or inspired by the environment, and especially here in the sort of northeast, uh, we get these beautiful leaves on the trees that turn orange, uh, so we typically see orange mostly in the fall when we have a much more orange environment. Next we have yellow. And yellow is another bright color that catches the eye easily. And uh, yellow can represent the sun, can represent spring, warmth, happiness, freshness. 
Um, so, you know, a nice color. And again, we see a lot in the springtime because the sun is starting to shine more. Um, a lot of the first flowers in spring are yellow, like daffodils and forsythia. Um, and then, of course, it's also associated with sort of lemons, which have this sort of citrusy kind of freshness uh, to it. And so, and again, warmth and happiness and, and things like that are usually tied to the color yellow. Next we have green. So green is a very common color in nature, uh, being the color of plants. So we see it a lot, um, we're very used to it, um, and it can re represent nature, health, fertility, growth, and wealth. Wealth especially here in America, because of course our currency is green. Oops, sorry. Um, so, uh, but pretty much across the world, it can also be a representation of wealth because growth and fertility are tied with wealth and pretty much every culture will see a sort of growth and fertility connection with green just because it's the color of plants. You think of a lush um, forest or a lush jungle or, or growing pastures and plants and crops, you think of green. Next we have blue, and blue is a fairly rare color for life, um, so you don't see a lot of plants or animals in blue, of course there are some, um, but we can see it everywhere because it's the color of water and it's the color of the sky, um, and blue can represent calmness, kind of coolness or coldness, purity and wisdom. Next we also have purple. Uh, purple is one of the rarest colors in nature, even more rare than blue. And purples have only recently become commonly available for people to wear and decorate with. And this because it is so rare in nature. Um, so before we were able to make chemical and synthetic dyes and pigments, um, people really had a hard time finding things that were suitable to make purple dyes with. So um, if we look back, we can see that anything that was purple, a purple cloth, um, was very, very expensive to make be just because finding pigments adequate to be able to do the dyeing was very hard and very expensive to do. So especially when we look back to sort of European history, um, purple and especially sort of royal blue and royal, royal uh, purples um, were only really worn by royalty because they're so expensive to make. And that's why we can a lot of times represent the color purple with royalty, but also with mystery and magic. And next we have brown. So brown is another very commonly seen color in nature and is commonly used in fashion. Um, so brown can represent comfort, earthiness, and dependability. Um, I think sort of a warmth along with that comfort, again, um, when we associate brown, we associate it with sort of the earth, and the earth is sort of like a, a comfort humility to it, um, being down to earth, uh, being sort of realistic and pragmatic. Um, also, you know, a lot of our favorite foods and comfort foods are brown, uh, coffee, tea, chocolate, cookies, uh, cakes, breads, um, a lot of these wonderful things, nuts are brown um, and tasty, uh, so we'll associate, you know, brown a lot of time with, you know, comfort foods and being delicious and that sort of uh, warmth that it brings. Next we have black, and black is another color that is seen in fashion a lot, and um, will make colors pop when paired together. Um, black can represent elegance, mystery, mourning, seriousness, and the nighttime. Now we have also white. Uh, white like black, black is often used in fashion and can pair well with most colors. It can represent purity, hope, lightness, and cold. Okay, now that we took a little bit of what these colors can mean and the emotions that they can evoke in, our, uh, in ourselves and in our customers when used properly, let's talk about the relationships between the different colors and how we can develop harmonies between them. So just like musical notes, colors can harmonize well or clash. 
So just like if I play a few notes on the piano together, they can either sound good and really beautiful and harmonize well, or they can sound really terrible together and kind of hurt our ears and kind of clash, just the way colors can. Um, and just like with notes and musical notes, um, we have different rules on how to set harmonies. So this has been a sort of topic that's been looked over for many, many years uh, by many, many people, and we've developed certain rules to follow to ensure that um, our colors will harmonize well, just like uh, different rules we've set out for if our notes are going to sound well when we play them on an instrument. Um, they're either going to resonate, harmonate, or not. Um, and we can tell if colors will harmonize primarily based on their location of the color wheel. So this is hopefully where the color wheel is going to make a little bit more sense and how we can utilize it to create our harmonies and develop better color palettes. So over here we have a, a few of our different harmonizing strategies um, and I'm going to go over each one in a little bit more detail but just while we have them here and we can see their relation on the color wheel, I'll go over them. So first we have monochromatic, and I talked a little bit about that before. So the monochromatic color harmony is really based on one hue, only one. Um, we don't see any others here. So we develop our monochromatic scale by adding either white, black, or gray just to that hue. So again, it's all going to be, let's say, blue colors if we choose blue as our base, but it's going to be varying lightnesses and darknesses of that pure hue. We call that monochromatic. Over here in analogous, we see an analogous color strategy. So the uh, analogous color strategy is to group colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. So here we have a primary yellow and a secondary orange and a blend of the colors in between to create our uh, analogous color scheme. So it's really sort of just our two colors sitting next to each other on the color wheel and whatever comes in between those colors. Now of course these are all showing, these both show four in their color palette but you can have as many or as few. So you can have a monochromatic by just having the hue. You don't have to um, iterate it again in lighter or darker versions. Or um, on the other hand, you can also make more. You can make lighter versions, darker versions, however you want. Uh, same with here with your analogous. You can scoot a few more in between here if you so desire. Uh, next we have complementary colors. And complementary colors are a really important harmony to understand. Um, and they are any color, so you pick a color, and then directly across from it on the color wheel, you will pick up its complementary color. And we're going to look at the main complementaries, um, but do know that we have a lot of complementary pairs, not just the, the main ones that we're going to talk about, but any color that you pick, whatever is directly across the color wheel from it is a complementary pair. And they're very, very powerful, visually striking um, color combos. Next we have what's called a split complementary. And the split complementary is a little less, let's say, striking, but also still very pleasing um, to our eye. So our split complementary is a little bit more difficult to understand, but really not too bad. So what we do is we'll take a base color. In this situation, our base color is blue. And then we'll find the complementary, which is obviously directly across, but we're not going to use the exact complementary. What we're going to do instead is we're going to pick colors that are just right next to the complementary on the color wheel. So blue complementary um, would be a bright orange, but instead of using that bright orange, that uh, um, pure secondary orange, what we're going to do is we're going to use the tertiary colors of a sort of more goldenrod and reddish orange instead. Uh, next we have a triadic, 
Uh, and the triad basically makes a, a, an equilateral triangle on the color wheel and picks colors based on that triangle. So it's, uh, again, three colors that are equally spaced apart on the color wheel. And we can kind of spin that wheel, that triangle. So imagine sort of little equilateral triangle right in here. And where it is now would be pointing to the sort of spring green, the orange, and um, this darker purple right over here. Um, but we can continue and sort of spin that triangle around and get any sort of color that we want or color combos that we want just by sort of spinning that around and getting those those three colors. Next we have a tetradic, which is a double complementary. So basically we pick two colors um, and then uh, their complementaries as well. And this is also formed by using a sort of um, rectangle. Uh, so this was formed by using a square or a triangle. This one's formed by using a rectangle, but you pick your two base colors. Typically, they're gonna be fairly close to each other um, on one end of the color wheel, and then you pick their complementary. So the complementary to this blue is this orange, and the complementary to this sort of darker purple is this uh, goldenrod up here. So let's take a little bit closer look at each one of these color harmonies and how they're used in fashion. Let's start with monochromatic. So monochromatic looks can be either of just one color or feature a different tint, tone, or shade variations of one color like we went over. And these are some examples of how it is used in fashion. And um, so monochromatic can be very successful, but what I'm gonna recommend for if you wanna use a monochromatic um, color palette is to really up your game with your textures and patterns. So this is, I think, what monochromatic really shines with. So if we look at especially sort of this example, we have a lot of different textures going on in this outfit. We have a very fuzzy jacket. We have a rib knit over here, which gives us sort of sort of a line texture, a, a smooth pant down here, so a, a sort of smooth texture. So we, what we are doing is we are adding all these textures on top of it. Um, and because it's monochromatic, uh, we get to sort of let those differences of those textures stand out a little bit more. And it also allows the a little bit more depth and um, interesting things going on with the look. So if this was all sort of a flat one texture, sort of smooth or whatever else, and it's monochromatic, it gets a little boring. Um, but if we sort of vary up the textures, change the textures, um, we get that sort of depth and richness um, without sacrificing um, it being too complicated or busy. Um, so again, here's actually a really great example of that over here. So this gentleman's wearing a monochromatic outfit, obviously with purple. Um, the white in there is okay because again, one's white is not a, a, a pure hue, it's a tone. So it's still monochromatic, even though you might think, oh, there's two colors, there's white and purple, but technically white is not a color. I know we were talking about white and black being a color, but technically white, black, and grays are not colors at all. Um, but anywho, um, we see a lot going on here. We see a, a, a sort of a, a matte texture up here. We see a check and a polka dot, um, which really could very easily become too over the top, especially mixing, mixing a, a print and a polka dot or a check and a polka dot. Um, but because it is monochromatic, it seems, you know, very classy. It's interesting. We get the, the uh, difference between the polka dot and the check is able to look very nice. Um, but if these were all different colors, it would look too busy and too much too quickly. Um, but because we have a monochromatic situation going on here, we're able to pair polka, polka dots and solids and checks all together, and it still looks quite elegant, even understated, you would say. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't look silly or over the top or too loud or too much. Um, it balances everything really, really well. Next, we have analogous uh, color scheme. And here we have different situations of our analogous color scheme. So again, the, just to remind you, an analogous color scheme will feature two colors situated next to each other on the color wheel and then blends of different colors in between. Now, most of these examples really are just showing two colors. And that's kind of just how fashion goes. We typically 
have, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, we don't typically mix too many colors within one outfit. Again, that depends on your customer um, and what you're going for in your collection. But if you sort of just generally look at, at how people wear color, um, we'll see two to three colors per look. So when we look at um, her over here, we can see, you know, these are, the yellows in here are very close, but um, we can still see that sort of analogous blending um, between our yellow and our orange. And then the skirt is a little bit more of an orangey yellow. Um, so we're blending in between those two colors. Same here. So our analogous colors are blue and green. And in between on, on some of sort of her details of accessories, um, uh, even sort of uh, here we have a darker blue so maybe this is our a dark blue and a dark green so the jacket is sort of blending a little maybe a little bit lighter but also in between a sort of darker blue and a, and a green um, down here on the shoes we see a teal um, which is a midway point between blue and green um, we see a little bit more teal up here on the necklace and, and sort of lighter blues here and here um, which will be a sort of monochromatic variant. So it's almost like a little bit of a mixing analogous and monochromatic because we're taking that blue and we're making it a little bit lighter on these different things. So a lot more colors in here, but it really all sits together because we are very closely relating all the different colors. Um, over here, again, another analogous uh, color scheme. The colors being red and purple next to each other and then sort of in between red and purple we have a sort of magenta so that is representing the in-between colors now do you have to um, show in between colors for analogous no it can be a two color scheme if you want that are just two colors situated next to each other on the color wheel um, but of course you can blend as many as you want in between so analogous is really at least two colors but to your heart's content how many more you want to add just so long as those colors sit in between each other on the color wheel next we have complementary so um, as i was saying before complementary colors produce a very strong combo and typically using complementary colors in one outfit is avoided because it can look too loud so um, if we sort of there's the traditional rules of fashion which have kind of been thrown out but it was a sort of tradition that complementary colors in one outfit is a no-no. Um, however, nowadays, like I said, those, um, those rules have sort of been you know, thrown out, like not wearing white after Labor Day or something like that. Um, those traditional rules no longer apply, and of course you can do it. But I would say uh, take it with a grain of caution, and especially how you're going to use those complementaries. Now we are very tempted to use complementaries because they just look gorgeous together. Complementary colors, um, like their name suggests, harmonize and just, I was gonna say sound, but look really, really good together. Um, and, uh, but the thing is they're incredibly eye-catching. Um, so think about your customer. Is your customer a little bit more shy? Are they wearing this to a place where they don't really want to stand out? Um, are they wearing it to a place that's a little bit more relaxed and casual? Or especially maybe in the workplace where, again, it it's, uh, has a little bit more emphasis on being um, subdued um, and fitting in. Uh, you know, who are they? Um, if they're that person, complimentary colors are not for them. Um, but if they are a person where, again, they want all the eyes in the room on them, uh, they are demanding attention, they're out there, um, they're kind of loud in their personality per se, um, then complimentary colors might be for them. Um, so as we look at these examples, we can sort of see um, especially the orange and blue complementary. So this is the harshest complementary that we have because they're the pure hues. Um, and, you know, I will see her in a crowd from a mile away. There is no missing her. Um, beautiful as it is. Um, and again, so long as she has the right personality to wear that color combo, she's got to be very self-confident, very out there, um, very willing. Um, but so long as she is, um, that color combo is going to be really great. 
And just a little note on how color combos are used. So especially blue and orange are really often used in ads and posters like other types of complementary colors uh, because they demand viewers' attention. So if you want a little sort of side uh, aside to this, go ahead and um, you know pause the video and Google orange and blue posters. Um, and your Google image result will fill up with all types of uh, posters and movie ads that utilize the blue-orange complementary color color scheme. And this is no accident. It's because it draws our eye. And of course, when people make posters, the one thing they want is for people to look at the poster. So the best way to do that is to make a color combo or a color scheme that is not only pleasing to our eyes, but demands our attention. Now over here, um, these are both our, our basic complementary colors. So again, um, just, just to go over it, so again, like I said, you can have many, many different complementary pairs because it's any hue and then whatever is directly across from the color wheel from it. Um, so, but we have sort of three main um, complementary color combos uh, just by working with sort of our basic um, you know, secondary and primary colors. Uh, one of them, of course, is orange and blue, the next is red and green, and the last is purple and yellow. Um, and these other two um, are really nice ways to utilize the complementary color combo, but in a more palatable, in a more wearable way. So in this middle image, she's wearing a red-green um, color combo, complementary color combo, but both the red and the green have been um, shaded. So uh, black has been mixed with the green and the red to make it darker. So um, it's not quite as intense uh, or strong or loud, but it still has that really nice harmony. So we've made it um, a lot um, easier to wear for the customer. Over here, we've done a similar thing, but instead of adding dark uh, color to it, uh, black, I made a shade out of it, we've made a tint out of it, we've added a light color to it. So here we don't see a really bright sort of vivid purple or a really bright vivid yellow. It's more of a pastel kind of lilac um, purple and a sort of soft pastel -y yellow. Um, and again, just like we did before, it sort of softened the impact. Still looks really great together as a color combo, but again, it, just softening that impact because we've softened the intensity of that hue to make it more wearable for our customer. Next, we have our split complementary. We can see this a lot in fashion. Um, and again, split complementary consists of three colors, one base color and the other two colors that are adjacent to that base color's complementary. Uh, look back at the color wheel if that is a little bit confusing to you because, again, it can't be a little bit. But again, um, when you look at it on the color wheel, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, split complementaries look very nice and are easier to use than our pure complementary color combos. So this is another alternative to using a pure complementary that's a little bit more wearable but still very pleasing and striking to our eyes. And we have some uh, examples of split complementary color combinations uh, right over here. Next we have triadic um, or color triads and again they are a set of three colors that are equally distanced from one another on the color wheel. And here we have just really two basic triadics, um, one consisting of our primary colors, yellow, blue, and red. Um, of course they are equally spaced um, from each other on our color wheel and um, create one of our you know most basic triads um, and then we have our secondary triad uh, on the right over here with orange, purple, green. Um, again, those secondary colors all in combination are also a tri uh, triadic uh, color combination. Next we have a tetradic, and uh, this is a color scheme based on four colors. And although it is one of the established uh, you know, color harmonies, we don't really see it that much in fashion. Because um, I mentioned before, people don't tend to like more than three colors in their outfit. And again, this depends on your customer occasion, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, when you get up there into four or more colors in one outfit, uh, you're getting on this sort of loud um, uh, territory. And again, depends on your customer. Is your customer that type of person? Because if it is, 
then that's where you're going to want to go. And it gets a little bit more difficult to sort of uh, align and harmonize so many more colors. Um, so it is a nice strategy if you are going to be utilizing a lot of different colors. And even if you aren't going to be using them all in one outfit, um, it's perfectly fine to use Tetradic color harmonies to create a color palette for a full collection. So you may have all these colors in a full collection um, and only use uh, two or three or, or whatever else, limit it um, uh, to each um, individual outfit. Um, and here we have, you know, two different examples of uh, Tetradic color schemes. This one's probably the better one because it really limits it down to those four. Um, and we see the red and green complementary and the blue and the orange complementary right there. Here we see similar, um, but they added the pink in there too, so it's really five colors. Um, so it's a Tetradic plus one uh, that they just sort of added on there. So how do we pick colors for a collection? So we went over, you know, different moods and feelings that colors can evoke. Um, so, you know, you're first going to think about that. Um, what is going to be conducive to your customer's preferences um, and also to occasion. So obviously people are going to wear different colors to different occasions. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, later. Um, and also sort of how we can harmonize the colors that we do choose so we know that we're choosing colors that look good with one another and we'll, it'll be a strong color palette that in the end will all look good as a collection. But how do we use them actually when we design? So um, what I see especially in beginning designers is people tend to focus a little bit too much on the what's quote unquote fun colors. So if we look at, you know, a wide pop population, you look out your window now on a crowded street, um, you're probably going to notice a few things. Uh, take a look at the colors. And this is sort of a good um, way to sort of analyze colors and uh, uh, think about what people wear. So next time you're out on the street or in the subway or something like that, um, you know, uh, or out celebrating, I guess, uh, take a look at what people are wearing and in what amounts and especially if you're in the New York City area you're going to see a lot of blacks um, but for the most part anywhere you're going to see the most amount of color in this sort of base color range and this is why I've created this sort of pyramid and it's supposed to represent how we use color in a collection It's kind of like the food pyramid uh, but down here we're going to use our base colors the most and they're kind of the ones that designers tend to forget about because they're not flashy or exciting. Um, they're blacks, they're neutrals, they're earth tones, they're shades and tints, they're white. Uh, they're not strong colors. Uh, they're easy to wear and do not draw too much attention uh, to the wearer. And the, the majority of our looks are going to be based on these colors. Um, because of what I said, they're easy to wear. They don't draw too much attention. Um, if one looks at a population, of course, these colors will be most present. So down here in the largest area of my color palette for my collection, I have my neutrals, my base colors, what I'm going to sort of um, use most in my collection. Now in the middle of the pyramid, we're going to see our main colors of the collection. And these colors are uh, the most used in the collection. Um, in terms of what colors are. Um, so these are again obviously colors, but these are a little bit sort of splashier. They're, you're you're going to notice um, a collection being. Um, again, since these don't draw the attention, even though there's probably in volume more of them, you might notice this color. So if I have say an outfit where this is the sweater and I have this as the pants, I'm going to notice this color. I'm not going to notice this. This is sort of just the, the pedestal or the frame or the background to this color. And, you know, let's say it's a short sleeve uh, uh, sweater um, with, you know, v-neck or whatever else, and these are the pants. In actual quantity, there's more of this color. But since this stands out more, you're going to think of this color more so in your outfit. 
you're going to think of it, oh, it's a mulberry um, look or whatever else, and we're going to tend to forget about those base colors, which is why beginning designers tend to forget about these base colors, even though they're very, very important. Um, up at the top here, we have accent colors, and you may be familiar with this term because it's often used um, in uh, interior design, and it's sort of meant to be what's the pop color, and it's reserved for the strongest colors, the, most, the ones that will make the most impact on the viewer. Um, and you can probably tell because if you just sort of look at this pyramid, even though this is the majority of the pyramid down here, your eye's going to go straight here. And that's what makes it a pop color. Um, you least amount of color here, small tiny bit, but your eye's going to go straight to it. It's going to go right to it. Um, also, because it's a pyramid, that's where the lines go. Anywho, uh, <laughs> they're used sparingly, though, and they're used only to sort of give an extra pop to certain details. So, again, a little goes a long way with our accent colors. So, think about, you know, um, neon colors that are used a lot in sort of athleisure or athletic wear. Um, we might just see a little stripe of neon down the side, but, oh gosh, does it make a big impact. A tiny tiny bit um, and again if we use our accent colors a too much um, it sort of ruins the whole thing it can be too loud um, uh, too over the top but when used sparingly um, it can really draw attention to what you want um, little details um, lines of the body um, so use it sparingly and only when you need something to really pop because again that it's gonna a little's gonna go a long way. It's like a strong spice. So color and geography. So not only does um, picking a color palette depend on you know your colors uh, customers um, emotions or what you want to evoke with your colors, what kind of emotions you want to evoke, but also depends a lot on geography. And we've talked about this before. Um, but here I just sort of want to briefly kind of exhibit um, what that looks like. So I have sort of different crowd street shots from all around the world, and we can see the different color palettes in each one. So over here on the left-hand side, um, they're halfway across the world. This is Times Square in New York City, and this is in Tokyo, um, but a very similar kind of approach to color. Um, what do we see most? Well, we see black. Um, what's next? Well, probably white. Um, what's next? Well, probably blue, because a lot of people wear jeans and things like that. Uh, but again, that indigo, a dark blue, um, in with our sort of base colors. Um, then we see grays and, you know, uh, some more, oh, a little bit of neutrals. Um, only in sort of rare instances do we see color pop out. So uh, what we see here in New York, we see reds maybe some greens, a little bit of blue, things like that. Same down here, I see maybe a red or, or so, you know, maybe some brighter blues, um, but very, very limited color palettes. And when they do use it, um, we tend to, to uh, go toward, quote unquote, safer colors, red. Um, hearkening back to, um, w w actually now I wanna sort of talk a little bit about wearable colors too. Um, uh, so I know this is a little bit of a tangent, um, but typically uh, red is a very, very safe color to wear. It looks good on all types of skin tones. And not only does it look good, but the red um, light that reflects off the, your red garment kind of reflects back up into your face and it gives more sort of warmth and color into your skin. And this is true um, for all skin tones, for pale, medium, dark, doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, uh, whenever I don't feel good, if I'm feeling a little sick or maybe a little hungover and I feel a little washed out in the face, wear red um, because that will make you look a little bit healthier, a little bit more vibrant. Um, and this is why red across you know, um, the ages, colors come in and out of style, um, but red is consistently a very well-selling color just because it's so easy for people to look good in red. Um, another very wearable color is blue. 
Um, blue tends to look good on a lot of different uh, uh, skin tones. Um, so so um, can be very popular with sort of guys and things like that. Um, we typically think of a collared shirt as either being white or blue. Uh, uh, jeans, of course, are blue. So we are going to see a lot of blue. Um, people want to match with their jeans or whatever else. Um, so blue and red, typically one of our highest sellers. Um, and you can see that across the heat uh, and about everywhere. I mean, here we don't see a lot of colors, but the colors we see are red and blue. Here we see red and blue, a few more greens, of course, um, but a lot of blue. Here, um, uh, let's finish around the globe, I guess. Uh, uh, this is Ac uh, Accra. Um, and again, it's a warmer climate. And so a lot of times in warmer climates, we're gonna see a lot of uh, more different colors. Uh, and this is a place where uh, uh, colorful fabrics is a lot more of a cultural tradition so we see those beautiful fabrics and bright um, happy colors all around we see bright greens uh, and again here's a, a lovely um, complementary color combo right there with the red and the green uh, we see pinks in the background and yellows and pink uh, more pinks and um, greens and all these wonderful colors and, and blues and um, uh, again much more colorful than we see over here in these colder climates. Um, here we have another warmer climate, which is, this is Mumbai. Um, and again, you can see a lot less black. Almost nobody is wearing black on the top. Few are wearing black on the bottom, but we see a lot of blue, a lot of red, some oranges, um, and things like that, a lot more color coming through. Um, and down here, we kind of see a little bit of a mix in between, this is LA. Um, so again, um, in typical American urban centers, we do have a shift away to a more sort of muted color palette, like over here. I know this is in North America, but, um, you know, Japanese and New York fashion have a lot of overlap. I know they're so far away and the cultures are so different, but it's so interesting to see two, two different cities, so different in culture and so different in, um, uh, location, uh, still have such a similar color palette. Um, so we see, again, we see black being used a lot. We see a lot of muted tones, but again, it's a warmer climate. Um, and again, a different sort of cultural attitude. So LA is sort of the home of the stars. A lot of people are kind of gunning for attention. Um, whereas New York people kind of, you know, you, you, when you go out, you kind of want to put your head down, get from point A to point B, not be noticed. Might be trouble if you get noticed. <laughs> but in LA, people are sort of want to get noticed. They're, you know, um, stars and, you know, actors and things like that. So, and again, with uh, combined with the warmer weather, uh, we see a lot more brighter colors and color tones in this sort of cityscape than we do over here. Now, why is it that colder climates have a more muted color palette in their sort of overall general population and warmer climates have a brighter one? You know, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to assume uh, or guess that it has to do with uh, nature. Um, so again, a lot of our connotations with colors and our relationships with colors comes from the environment. And when you live in a warm environment, the plants are lush, they're growing all year round, the flowers are blooming all year round, you're probably going to get beautiful tropical foliage growing and that in and of itself is bright and colorful so you're going to just dress to match the environment uh, when you go to places like new york or tokyo we have a long winter um, where things die off and the plants die and there is no color from coming from the environment for a long period of the year um, so because there's just simply less color um, in our environment throughout the year you're just going to see people reflecting their environment. It's sort of uh, natural for us to do that. So color and personality. So we've sort of touched on this subject a lot. Um, but again, the colors that people wear can say a lot about their personality. Uh, to better choose a color palette for your collection, try to understand your target customer and their relationship with uh, color. Um, and starting with just their base personality. You know, um, are they more serious? Are they kind of more somber? Or are they um, a little shyer? Are they someone that kind of wants to fit in? Um, then you're gonna have a little bit more of a muted color palette. 
Um, and we can sort of see the difference here. Now, we don't know anything about these two women other than they like oversized sunglasses. Uh, but just by their outfits, you know, we can sort of apply personality traits. She's going to be a lot more serious, maybe down to earth, um, uh, kind of no frills, maybe more practical, uh, so on and so forth. She is sort of very bland color palette, just a, a monochromatic gray. Um, over here, lots of colors, loud design all over the place. She's going to be um, uh, uh, more out there, um, more quirky, eccentric, um, kind of uh, more over the top in her lifestyle, uh, more attention seeking, um, uh, maybe more dramatic, um, you know. Uh, so again, who is your customer? And of course, there's all different shades in between. These are two ends of a spectrum. And just like there's lots of different types of people, there's going to be lots of different types of people for um, each sort of colorway. Um, you know, it's not all or nothing because, of course, there's many different types of personalities. Um, and it's up to you to decide or find out uh, who your customer really is and what their relationship with color is. Um, and also occasion really matters. So uh, just like we've talked about, you know, um, talking about not only who your customer is, but what occasion they're going to be wearing it to, uh, that's going to affect your color as well. So um, when we think about things like workwear, professional wear, um, we tend to see a lot more dark, muted colors, um, a lot more limited color palette, a lot more sort of like your New York kind of color palette on the scene. Uh, we're not going to see bright um, colors. We're not going to see massive amounts of colors in one look. Um, again, muting your colors, choosing those blacks, darker grays, um, more sort of traditional, somber, serious colors with a limited palette um, associates, a, associates itself more with a sort of professional vibe. Um, so that's what we're going to see in the workplace. Uh, that's what we're going to see from professional collections. Um, when we move to athletic wear, uh, we're going to see a lot of blacks because uh, black hides sweat. <laughs> Uh, but we're going to see those pops of uh, bright colors um, because, again, those bright colors make us excited. Um, they give us energy. And what are we doing when we're wearing our, you know, athletic gears? We're working out or we're playing sports or things like that. So we'll see incorporation of, of brighter colors um, uh, when we do that. Uh, when we look at sort of clothing that is made for parties and things like that, we're going to see a lot more stronger color combinations, uh, a little bolder, a little bit more meant to stand out, um, a little bit more fun, a little bit more playful. Um, because again, when we're going to parties or different things like that, or even a date, um, we want to stand out. We want to seem fun. We want to attract the eye. So again, occasion is really important. Um, when we move sort of to formal wear, especially when you look at you know things like evening gowns, evening gowns tend to be monochromatic. If anything, it's a two color combination, um, but for the most part, they're gonna be somewhat monochromatic. Um, this is not true across the board, of course. Um, we saw earlier um, an evening gown with a tetradic color palette, which is a ton of colors, but Overall, um, it's going to be sort of monochromatic. It sort of makes a uh, more of a solid statement um, that one color go up, up from down. Um, why it's like that, I don't know. It just is. It seems to work really well. Um, and again, just having that one color from head to toe uh, makes a very striking impact, a very powerful impact. And we're also going to see stronger colors used in those evening gowns. Um, so in that amount, uh, all the way up and down. And of course, there are many examples of, of multicolored ones, but um, just from what I've seen, you tend to see you know, your floor-length evening gown in one color or a monochromatic color screen. So color and personality. So what is your favorite color? How do you like it? Why is it your favorite color? Um, does it say something about you? Uh, my favorite color is purple. 
Um, it used to be red, and then I don't know. It's purple, um, kind of like a, uh, a, a a bright reddish purple. Um, what I like. Um, anywho, uh, so just to sort of reflect on what we've learned and take a look at these three dresses. Now this is the same person uh, in the same dress. But with each color, we have very different colors. We've got red, we've got blue, we've got black. Um, what is the sort of feeling that you get? Are you getting different feelings from each dress? Are you getting maybe a sexy vibe from her with the red dress? Are you getting maybe a cool, um, uh, maybe calm, collected vibe from her? Are you getting a sort of classy, elegant vibe from her? If so, it's not her, it's not the dress, it's the color. Um, so again, hopefully this helped you um, think a little bit more about color and the world of color and how we use it and just how powerful a tool it is uh, to use as a designer. I mean, it's, it's probably the first thing that we really get impacted by as a viewer when we look at it a look. The color hits us first. And we all have emotional ties to color, whether we consciously or subconsciously realize it, um, it's unavoidable. Uh, color impacts us, unless of course you're completely colorblind. <laughs> but not too many people are completely colorblind. So um, again, hopefully this was helpful, and I just want to go over a few, a uh, couple other um, helpful tips um, for you to uh, use when creating a color palette. And I'm gonna first go over to Illustrator. So a lot of you guys are using Illustrator for your flats and things like that. Um, and of course you have access it through the remote desktop, but it has a really great color palette building tool right within it, and I like to use it a lot. Um, so the first thing we do is, you know, I'm just creating this to create a color, um, just pulling down a square, because you, you have to have a color that you're gonna start with. And I'm gonna start with a color um, doesn't really matter what. Um, let's go with what I said was going to be my favorite color, a nice bright reddish purple. There it is. So there's my favorite color. And once we've established the one color that we want to use, um, and this could be uh, your accent color, I would recommend it to be your accent color. If it's not your accent color, um, uh, at least one of your mains. Um, and then what we're going to do is I'm going to go to Window. If it's not up already, it actually is up already in your color uh, uh, box down here. Go to Color Guide. And again, if it's not up, just go to Window, Color Guide. And it will, well, if it's up there, it'll, it'll take it away. But if it's not up there, it'll bring it up. Um, and let's take a look at what it's saying. Let me enlarge it and get rid of this so it's a little easier to see. Oh, look, it created a color palette for me. This would be a lovely color palette to use. Now, not only is it giving me the pure color palette, which is right here, it's also giving me the tint and shade variation. So I can pick um, a monochromatic one from up here, um, picking from my shades and tints. Um, I can also pick uh, from down here, shade and tint variations of that to sort of build it up. So I'm you know, free to pick any one of these that please me. Um, but this is only one color harmony. If I come here to the drop down box, I get lots of other color harmonies and um, lots more than we even went over. But I think if I went over every single one of these, uh, you'd be bored to tears. Uh, but they're all based on um, the color the harmonies that we went over. So uh, they're sort of different variations and alterations and additions to some of them. So here's complementary. So there's our complementary. You might say, oh, okay, why is it not yellow? Um, you said the complementary color to purple was yellow. Well, this isn't a true purple. Remember how I said I liked the warmer? It was a little bit warmer, so it was a little bit more on that red side, which means it's going to move its place uh, a little bit closer to the red on the color wheel. And so we're going to move a little bit away from yellow to green on the other side. So that's why we're getting uh, this complementary that is not pure yellow. Um, this is uh, the one we were looking, oh no, it's a slightly different one. So it's giving a um, complementary color guide, but it's also just using very close colors or different tonal ranges to those colors. Here we have our triad. We went over what triads were. There's the triad color combo for this. 
compound. We didn't go over compound, but that's okay. We have some high contrast ones, which uh, try to pick uh, very um, different color tones, ones that will stand out very brightly against each other. So how very high contrast. So again, you can sort of scroll through these different uh, color palettes and color harmonies, use different ones, and develop your color palette like this. Remember, nothing is ever set in stone. Um, you can wiggle around, you can alter, you can choose, you can um, use different color guides, go back and forth. But at the end of the day, when you put all your colors together, you know, use your gut instinct. Does it look good? Does it please your eyes? Is it pleasing to look at? Um, and for the most part, I wish I had a, a more scientific or more definite way of telling you this, but it's the same thing with, um, you know, writing a song. Um, do the notes that you are writing down sound good together? If yes, well, great. You have a great song. Uh, are the colors that you're choosing look good together? Yes, great. Then you've got a color palette. No? Well, then you've got to tweak it. Now, this is... Um, uh, the color palette builder sort of for um, Illustrator, but if you go online there and just Google color palette generator, there are a ton of different color palette generators that you can like that work in a very similar way as the one in uh, Illustrator. And you, they you typically have you pick one color and will give you uh, different color palettes um, based on that. Uh, color and then based on our harmony rules. So use different ones, use your own um, creations, uh, whatever you like, um, and hopefully now you'll feel just a little bit more confident on what colors you're using and uh, have a little bit sort of more knowledge to help you build a stronger color palette um, in your next collection. Don't be afraid of color. Don't be afraid of adding too many colors to your collection. Because again, if you follow the rules of harmony, you can use many different colors and still make sure that they all go together. All right, guys. That was our little bit on color. And I'll see you later. Bye-bye.